There once was a monk named Father Barsoom, who is now departed to heaven. This man was in the War of 67 and also the War of 73, and he was a tranquil person, and he had a peace about him that was infectious. He remained in the army during the, its attrition between the two wars, so he got bored and went home, which was nuts because they weren't supposed to leave the army. His body was small, and he looked like a very weak soldier. Anyway, he returned, and another private asked him, Where were you? He answered, I went home. The other said, Are you crazy? He said, I was bored. The other said, My friend, this will get you put in military jail. He said, What are we going to do? What, whatever happens, happens. The other said, Okay, just tell the leader you had someone sick you needed to take care of and you couldn't find him, so you excused yourself. This guy loved him, so he was trying to cover up for him. The leader called for him and asked him, Private, did you go home yesterday? He said, Sir, yes, sir. The leader asked, Why? He said, I was bored, sir. So the leader was amazed at his answer because to say such a thing, the kid must have been crazy or something. The whole world was going to come crashing down. And at those times, the world was really rough. The leader asked him, Didn't anyone tell you to give an answer other than this one? He said, Sir, they told me, sir. The leader asked, well, why didn't you give another answer? He said, sir, I can't lie, sir. After that, whenever there was a problem in the camp and the leader wanted to know exactly what happened, he told them, bring me Private Nabil. He's the only one who will tell me as it is. I told you all of that so that to come to this point. When the war broke out in 73, they were on the front lines. He told us that when shots began firing, every one of them, from the officers to the soldiers, were scared to death and he would go around to each of them and pat them on the back and say, don't be scared, God is with you, this will pass. And they would look at him embarrassed because they worked six or seven years to be prepared for this situation. Then they got terrified in the moment of truth and he was the only one who wasn't scared. None of it made a difference to him. Do you understand the idea I'm trying to get at? If a true Christian is present, one that has no anxiety, that rests assured and truly trusts God, is the most beautiful evangelist. He doesn't care for evangelizing or preaching. However, he will be a silent evangelist. Because of this, when we worry, we obstruct God's work. When we worry, we become a copy of the world. What's the difference then between them and us? The one who has Jesus becomes just like the one who doesn't have Jesus. The one waiting for heaven is just like the one not waiting for heaven. It doesn't make a difference. You worry just like them. That's why Jesus says, for all these things the nations of the world seek after. Protect what differenti differentiates you and the things that make you different. The most important thing that makes you different is that you have peace. You don't worry. Any worry you have, throw it on God. Any distressing thought you have, you know how to do away with it very quickly. Any internal fears you have, you resist them. Make your language reveal you, the language that we mentioned earlier and agreed on. Everyone else says money and bread and our living, but you will say God is doing good for us. Everything is good. He carried, his, uh, carried us yesterday. He'll carry us tomorrow. God is present. It's destiny to come to an end. Your language is different. You don't say the frustrating and depressing things that the world says. Let yourself be a source of healing for people. Don't be worried and one who spreads anxiety. Let your presence in any place make others feel restful because your peace will influence them, not their anxiety influencing you. Your trust in God will defeat their fears, not their fears making you lose your peace. And the verse that says, and your father knows that you need these things. This verse about your father knowing also extinguishes anxiety. Why? Sometimes our problem is when we think about God, we say, well, is he going to listen to me? I'm a sinner. I'm weak. I made promises I didn't keep. I'm bad. My friend, he knows. He knows your weakness. Why do you imagine that God gets surprised by you and the fact that you're weak? Pardon me, but when were you ever righteous? More than anyone, he sees us, our failures and our weaknesses. Yet he received us and made us his beloved children despite all that. So these words, your father knows, gives rest to the soul. Why? Because he knows your capacity. He knows you won't be able to do much. And if you made promises, he knows you won't be able to deliver very much. Nevertheless, he works with you and he's very down to earth, so that gives you rest. Also, your father knows what's happening around you. 
Do you think God doesn't realize what's happening in politics or what's going on around us? Of course he sees it and everything is in his hands. Your father also knows what's coming and what has passed. Maybe you'll forget yesterday and definitely you don't know tomorrow. God knows yesterday and knows tomorrow very well. So the idea that your father knows should cast out all worries. God knows. So when you say God is present, good. God loves me, good. God is powerful, good. God knows, good. Any one of these phrases is a magical drug to cure anxiety. If you go into words and really take them in. Finally, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. What does it mean to make the kingdom of God first? It means the spiritual food takes priority over the bodily food. As long as we are focusing on the body's food more than on the spirit's food, we will not stop worrying. The body demands anxiety. How many of us put prayer and the Bible before breakfast and lunch? It's about priorities. You're going to eat. We're all going to eat. But what are the priorities? For this reason, the church requires fasting prior to the divine liturgy and says we will take communion while we're fasting. Not because food is sinful in and of itself, no, but because we have a concept, which is the spirit comes before the body. We're spiritual people. We're going to take off our bodies in the end, but not our spirits. So nurture your spirit before your body and you will have victory over your worries. Put the Bible and prayer and communion and time alone with God and praising God, anything from that stuff before your food and drink, and you will prevail. Put the salvation of people before the satisfaction of people. Pleasing people makes us worry because we want to satisfy them, but the satisfaction of people is impossible. What do you say we forget about trying to satisfy people and instead we busy ourselves with their salvation, whether they get upset or not? What will concern me is that they go to heaven. Then you'll find that you're not worrying because it won't matter that much whether or not you please them. Then all these things will be added to you. I'll say it another way. Make God bigger and he'll make you bigger. Meaning what? Meaning make God big in your mind. Let him fill your mind and you'll discover that you got bigger all on your own. What I mean by you got bigger is your value increased. God made something of you. He makes you something valuable because he has a big place in your life. Make God happy and he'll make you happy. When you busy yourself with making him happy, you'll find yourself happy automatically. Listen to God and he'll listen to you. As long as your ears are open and you want to hear God, all your prayers, whether big or small, will be answered. So make God bigger and he'll make you bigger. Make God happy and he'll make you happy. And listen to God and he'll listen to you. And glory be to God forever. I mean.